world watching Israel and Gaza as a seat of democracy remains vacant here at home. Time is running out for Israeli defense forces to track down and rescue hostages taken by Hamas terrorists into Gaza last week. The developments on the ground, plus... We're going to go in and are going to ensure that we only come out when every single one of the last Hamas terrorists are gone. The American men and women who are being called to the front lines in Israel as thousands answer the call for service. And... Personally, I don't know of anybody in America that can command 217 votes out of the Republican conference right now. The country remains without a speaker, without business being able to be conducted, without the person who is supposed to be third in the presidential line of succession as war breaks out. What happens next and the hits America's leadership on the world stage is now taking as the congressional chaos reaches new heights. Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the threat of a looming ground invasion in Gaza and the calls by Israel for 1.1 million people to evacuate. The concerns tonight by many, where do they go? Israel dropped leafless into northern Gaza Friday morning, telling residents to evacuate to the south of Gaza within 24 hours. Hamas has encouraged everyone to stay where they are. Even as Israel retaliates for the terror attack executed almost a week ago by Hamas, the death toll continues to mount, particularly now in Gaza, with at least 1,800 people now killed. The Palestinian government says an Israeli strike targeted a convoy heading south, 70 killed, 200 injured there. Tonight, we are getting some new dramatic video of Israeli Navy commandos in the hours after the massacre, pulling Hamas terrorists out of an Israeli military outpost. And tensions are also flaring today in the northern part of Israel after reports of an incident near the border with Lebanon. Tonight, there is concern about whether Hezbollah will join that conflict. Our Mola Lenghi is tracking that from Beirut. Here in Beirut, thousands have come out to rally in support of Palestinians and against to denounce Israel. This, as the region and really the world, is bracing themselves for the possibility of this conflict escalating if Hezbollah, who's putting on this rally, decides to join in the fight. Much more from Mola in a moment and our team in the region. We are also tracking security concerns here at home. But we begin tonight with Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel with the concerns ahead of a potential looming ground invasion. They've been under relentless bombardment for seven long days and nights. And tonight, as many as a million Palestinians are on the move, told to leave their homes immediately and run for their lives. The message came from the sky, Israeli leaflets raining down, warning Gazans they have just 24 hours to move away from the border. A few hours to pack an entire lifetime. With all the borders closed, the only place they can head is south. Some by car, others on foot. And even while they did as they were told, Israel continued to bomb. Today, a rocket striking a convoy of civilians fleeing, killing 70 people, according to Palestinian officials. Israel retaliating for last Saturday's massacre of more than 1,300 people by Hamas. More than 1,800 Palestinians have died since then, too. President Biden, while standing squarely behind Israel, today calling the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Gaza an urgent priority. We can't lose sight of the fact that the overwhelming majority of Palestinians had nothing to do with Hamas and Hamas's appalling attacks, and they're suffering as a result as well. The question now, where are all these people supposed to go? The entire Gaza Strip is about the size of Philadelphia. It's one of the most densely populated places on the planet, and Israel has bombed the last remaining border crossing into Egypt. 21-year-old college student Afaf Najjar documenting her family's journey. Salam everybody. Uh, today uh, morning we woke up to the news that we had to, to uh, evacuate. She describes the drive south as horrifying. And even when she got to the end of the journey, it wasn't the sanctuary she was expecting. The moment we arrived to Khan Yunus, uh, we realized that airstrikes were happening in Khan Yunus as well. Uh, very heavy ones. Just uh, just a couple of minutes ago, there was uh, one that shook the entire house. 
For its part, Hamas is urging Gazans to stand firm and not heed the evacuation orders. The White House accusing them of using innocent civilians as human shields. And while civilians flee, the militants dig in, releasing this video showing the sophisticated warren of underground tunnels they built in Gaza, where they hide and launch their rockets. Across the border in Israel, the military buildup nearly complete. It feels we're now on the eve of a significant military movement by the Israelis into Gaza. The men, the munitions, the tanks are all into place. And now they're just waiting for the order, if it comes, to move across that border. And we spotted this giant military bulldozer. It often leads the charge, ploughing through booby traps and landmines, destroying everything in its path. And the Israeli military releasing this video, which they say shows strikes on Hamas targets, including anti-tank missile launchers firing rockets into Israel. Each day, the fighting and the suffering only grows. And Ian joins me now from Tel Aviv. Ian, you've reported from inside Gaza before in prior conflicts. The people of Gaza, as we've heard, now have under 24 hours to evacuate. Realistically, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, it's a huge undertaking. The United Nations, along with a number of human rights organizations, have pointed out it's not really viable to try and move that many people, even if they wanted to leave their homes. I mean, we've been speaking to people who had to try and pack their things together and move southwards today, and, and it's very, very difficult. Whether you're on foot or you're in a car, it's, it's very, very difficult conditions. And one of the people that we spoke to, as you heard in that report, she said even when they reached the point where they were told to go to the point of safety, there was still bombing taking place. Everyone is poised for this land military operation. Everyone's assuming that is why the Palestinians in the northern part of the Gaza Strip have been told to leave. We've seen all the infrastructure put into place. We've also seen over the last day a number of raids by Israeli uh, special forces inside Gaza itself, hunting for Hamas material, mass weapons uh, and also uh, looking for any evidence of the hostages they say they've collected some evidence that might help it but life is going to be very very difficult life already was difficult a lot of people have lost their lives uh, over 1800 Palestinians over 1300 Israelis and the fear is that actually despite all the horrors that we witnessed over the last week that for Gazans at least things are about to get even worse Phil it feels like an impossible situation at times. Ian Panel from Tel Aviv tonight. Ian, thank you. We turn now to some information coming out tonight that a pair of classified CIA intel reports warned of a potential escalation in violence by Hamas in the run-up to its massive assault on Israel. And it comes as Israel is still finding Hamas operatives inside the country. Our James Longman is in Tel Aviv tonight. Tonight, new questions about whether U.S. intelligence was tracking increased threats from Hamas in the weeks before its attack on Israel. According to the New York Times, two CIA reports, including one issued just days before, warned about a potential escalation in rocket fire from Gaza. But the routine analysis reportedly had no details about the scale and scope of the terror attack, including the new tactic of a ground assault. Before this headline broke today, Defense Secretary Austin was asked during a stop in Israel what the U.S. knew before for Saturday's bloodshed. If we had known or if we know of a pending attack against uh, an ally, we would clearly inform that ally. Nearly a week after the unprecedented attack, Israeli forces are still hunting for Hamas terror cells in southern Israel. And tonight, for the first time, we're seeing images from Israeli Navy commandos retaking a military outpost just hours after it was captured by terrorists on Saturday. This man dragged away, bloody and naked. Those Navy commandos can be heard shouting to Israeli soldiers who are being held captive by Hamas in a bunker there. We are coming, they say. <laughs> that raid just hours after the massacre, one of at least six battles. There, some 60 Hamas terrorists were killed. Israeli forces were able to rescue 250 hostages. The injured rushed away by stretcher. But tonight, at least 100 more hostages remain in the hands of Hamas. And James joins me now. James, some Americans are being evacuated, as we know, out of Israel. But what does that operation look like? 
Well, Phil, the first State Department uh, flight charters went out of Israel today. They've been putting on these special flights for them. Thousands more Americans are set to be getting more of these flights soon. Plus, there's a real issue with commercial uh, flights out of this country. So many big commercial airliners have just been cancelling their flights. We've had people coming up to us uh, where we are here in Tel Aviv asking us if we know how they can get home because uh, flights just keep getting cancelled. So many airlines are just not confident sending their planes into this environment. For that reason, the United States government is now in talks with the three big US carriers to get more flights out of Europe, particularly out of Greece, so that uh, more Americans Americans can get home. They want to get them to, to send larger airplanes so that there are more seats for more Americans so that more people can get back to the U.S. Phil. All right. James Longman from Tel Aviv as well tonight. James, thank you. Meantime, fears that the region could see spillover from this war becoming a reality. Militant group Hezbollah has jumped into the conflict between Israel and Hamas terrorists. Armola Lange has been posted in Beirut, Lebanon, where there is support for the Iran-backed militant group. And Mola joins us now. Mola, there have been clashes between Hezbollah and Israel right along the Lebanon border. What can you tell us about them? Well, Phil, as you know, that border area has been an area of concern uh, really since the outbreak of fighting began in Israel. Fears that those skirmishes uh, might escalate, sp uh, sparking a, a broader conflict uh, throughout the region. There has been a sort of tit-for-tat missile exchange between Hezbollah and Israel uh, over the last few days, but it has largely remained uh, isolated, localized, uh, aimed at military targets. Uh, but today, uh, that missile fire turning deadly when a journalist, Hassam Abdullah, a uh, cameraman for Reuters, uh, who was covering the clashes along the border there, he was on the Lebanese side, in southern Lebanon, the Lebanese side of the border, uh, he was killed by rocket fire. Uh, six other journalists were also injured in the shelling. Uh, that, that, that struck their cars, it struck obviously the journalists, creating a, a, a deadly, fiery, uh, bloody scene there. Uh, and it appears that an Israeli shell landed in that gathering of international journalists. Uh, no statement yet from Israel. Uh, Hezbollah has released a statement condemning the attacks. Uh, and as you know, Israel has positioned tens of thousands of troops along its border with Lebanon, Israel's northern border, shoring up that northern front uh, in anticipation of a possible attack uh, from Hezbollah. All of this intensifying concerns about escalation of this conflict. Phil. Yeah, and, and Mola, you witnessed a, a rally in support of Hezbollah earlier today where you are. What was the message from people who were there? Yeah, thousands of people turned out for this rally in the heart of Beirut, uh, thousands of people in support of Hezbollah, thousands of people in support of Palestinians. Uh, all of them were denouncing Israel, calling them a criminal actor, denouncing the United States uh, for supporting Israel. Uh, you know, you heard the, the, some of the death to America chants uh, and attendees uh, asking where the international community was uh, for the Palestinian civilians uh, who were being killed. And I'm wondering, Mola, was there anything said at that rally about potential military action from Hezbollah? Well, Hezbollah officials were there. They hosted the rally. Uh, several of them uh, spoke to the thousands of people uh, in attendance. And the major takeaway from those officials who spoke, Phil, was that they are monitoring the conflict in Israel, uh, that they are standing by, and that when and if the time is right, they will be ready to act. All right, Mola Lenghi from Beirut, Lebanon tonight. Mola, thank you. President Biden spoke today to the families of Americans still unaccounted for, some of them believed to be hostages held by Hamas in Gaza. The president commented on that call during a stop in Philadelphia today. They're, they're going through agony, not knowing what the status of their sons, daughters, husbands, wives, children are. You know, it's gut-wrenching. I assured them my personal commitment to do everything possible, everything possible to return every missing American to their families. We're not going to stop till we bring them home. Let's bring in Mary Bruce now. Mary, what more have you learned about this call? 
Well, Phil, the president spent over an hour speaking with the families on this video call, and this was emotional. The families sharing personal stories about their loved ones and talking about what this horrific ordeal has been like for them. And now you heard the president there vowing to do everything he can to bring these American hostages home. But the U.S. is reaching out so far to countries that have influence over Hamas and offering assistance to Israel, offering U.S. intelligence and experts to help with this recovery effort. But Phil, the White House has also been very frank that right now they do not know where these hostages are being held or what condition they're in. Phil. Mary Bruce from the White House. Mary, thank you. Meantime, local police departments are on heightened alert. Given the war in the Middle East and Hamas's call for a worldwide day of rage and the ripple effects that see some people taking to the streets here at home. Here's ABC's Trevor Alt. Tonight, thousands of demonstrators shutting down streets in Manhattan. The protesters gathering not for Hamas, but for the Palestinians caught in the middle, many of them demonstrating against Israel. This is a pro-Palestinian demonstration in the heart of Times Square. We've seen the people really pouring in. It's peaceful, but it's passionate, and it's not popular with everybody here in New York City. The NYPD says the key is going to be making sure people aren't on top of each other, demonstrators of each side. That's when you have the violent clash. Those demonstrators met by counter-protesters supporting Israel. The demonstrations coming as Hamas calls for that worldwide day of rage, putting police departments from coast to coast on high alert. Tonight, police say they've issued at least two summonses to protesters fighting, but by and large, the demonstrations have been peaceful. Supporters of Israel also gathering in Washington, D.C., and in San Francisco, this rally calling for the hostages to come home. Beyond the demonstrations, authorities concerned about possible violence. The NYPD calling for its more than 30,000 officers to be available for duty if needed. Multiple agencies stepping up patrols at synagogues, schools, and on public transit. That while there is no credible threat, we have increased our presence at the major transportation terminals and throughout the transit system. And Trevor joins me now. Trevor, how intense are these concerns from law enforcement right now? Yeah, Phil, I would say it's not so much intense as it is steadfast and that they are stressing they're taking any possible violence very seriously. I mean, they have said over and over again there is no credible threat of violence, but they do specify, especially American counterterrorism officials, they say any kind of global declaration for a day of rage is enough that all Americans need to remain vigilant. Phil? All right, Trevor Alt, thanks so much. Now to the ongoing chaos on Capitol Hill, day 10 after the ouster of former Speaker McCarthy. And today, Republicans nominated someone else to be the next speaker, but even he doesn't have enough votes to win as Congress heads out for the weekend. Here's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Tonight, chaos and dysfunction on Capitol Hill. Could you Can get to 217? 10 days after Kevin McCarthy was ousted, now a new <laughs> nomination for speaker conservative firebrand Jim Jordan. Congress is broken. Less than 24 hours ago, the nominee was Steve Scalise, but he suddenly dropped out, realizing he wouldn't get enough support. Jordan confident heading into closed door talks. I think I can unite the conference. I think I can go tell the country what, what we're doing and why it matters to them. And we'll talk about that. Can you get but I'm in, I, I'm in. I think so, yes. I feel very confident in that. But after a tense five hour meeting, we learned he did not have the votes. Jordan can only afford to lose the support of four Republicans to become the next speaker. In a secret ballot, he lost 81. <laughs> Are you supporting Jordan? Uh, no. Then a second ballot. Jordan lost 55. Do you seem like you're very far off from electing a new Speaker of the House? I mean, we're not close. We got to get there. Jordan is backed by former President Donald Trump. The Ohio representative is one of the Republicans leading the impeachment inquiry into President Biden and the founder of the far right House Freedom Caucus that often gave McCarthy trouble. And tonight, there is fear among some Republicans that no one can unite the party. There's not a person in America and that includes the Republican conference that is going to get 217 votes out of this body. Just not. Our thanks to Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill tonight. We are going to remain on top of the developments out of Israel and Gaza, and there's still much more to get to right here on Prime tonight. A wild scene caught on camera as a woman opens fire inside of a police department, the dangerous moments before she was apprehended. Up next, hundreds of thousands of Israelis are returning to their homeland as the war with Hamas intensifies. How far some are traveling to answer the call. 
whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. The war between Israel and Hamas is taking a deadly toll on both sides of the border. As Israel's army mobilizes for a ground offensive, hundreds of thousands of reservists have been called to serve, with others enlisting voluntarily. Joining them, Israelis from every corner of the globe who are rushing back to their homeland to take up arms and fight for Israel. Juju Chang with the story. All of my, my unit was called up. My brother's units were called up. There was no way I was going to stay in New York and try and, you know, hope or pray for the side. As the bombs rained down on Israel and carnage was unleashed by Hamas militants. All right, was lucky enough to get a ticket. Noy Leib packed up his gear and a few belongings in New York City and headed to the airport. We wish to strengthen the residents of South. An Israeli Defense Force reservist, he says that even with years of military training, this is far beyond anything he's witnessed before. And now we're ready with all the gear. Are you prepared? for what that kind of combat looks like? I don't know if anyone can just wake up one day and be prepared, but mentally, we're all there. Physically, we're all there. We're going to go in and we're going to ensure that we only come out when every single one of the last Hamas terrorists are gone. Leib is just one of roughly 360,000 Israeli reservists answering the call to fight for their country. Many living around the globe now heading home, like these young people flying from Peru in a viral video chanting, Long live the Israeli nation, posted by Instagram user Natasha Raquel. This young couple, Natalie and Ido, from New York, now separated by war. Ido happened to be in Israel for his best friend's wedding last week. He was set to come back on Sunday, but courageously volunteered to go back to reserves. And the parents, like New Jersey-born chiropractor Scott Lawrence, whose four children flew from Spain and San Francisco to Israel to serve. We are painfully proud that our children have a, a higher purpose in themselves. There's, there's a mixed feeling. Uh, as a parent. This mobilization of troops back to Israel happening as the death toll in the country keeps mounting. The Israeli military says more than 1,200 people, including 189 soldiers, have died in Israel since Saturday. My colleague Matt Gutman was in Ashkelon, just north of the Gaza border, where Hamas rockets are still bombarding Israel. Above us, you can see so many streaks of smoke crisscrossing the sky. Across that border, the Israeli military's punishing retaliatory airstrikes have taken a deadly toll. 
Palestinian Ministry of Health says that more than 1,100 people have been killed and that 5,300 have been injured in Gaza, so many of them children. Doctors Without Borders say that every single patient at one of their Gaza clinics was a child between 10 and 14. 21-year-old Afaf Najjar tells us she can't stop shaking. There is nothing that we can do. Even the place that I'm in right now is uh, already almost out of water, almost out of food. And amid the chaos, 17 Americans still missing, some believed to be among the dozens of hostages taken by Hamas. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken speaking before heading to Israel. We have a number of Americans who remain unaccounted. Uh, we are working very closely with the government of Israel to determine their whereabouts and if they have been taken hostage by Hamas uh, to work to secure their release. We stand with Israel. We'll continue to do so. And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu making an historic announcement, the creation of a unity government working with his political adversaries after years of widespread political unrest that spilled out onto the streets. <laughs> הערב הקמנו ממשלת חירום לאומית. עם ישראל מאוחד, והיום גם ההנהגה שלו מאוחדת. אנחנו נלחמים באויב אכזר, אויב שהוא גרוע מדאעש. That feeling of unity extends to Israelis like Noy, offering his service. He first joined the Israeli military in 2009 while he was living in Canada. I was in the paratroopers unit and, you know, it was the... The regular three-year-long military service that for Israeli citizens is compulsory. And every year since then, I've been doing reserve duty once a year for about three to four weeks. But the entrepreneur with an MBA from Michigan is preparing for more than just his own journey back to Israel. The army isn't always ready to, to have, you know, over 500,000 soldiers come mobilize and, and partake in a war. So you have equipment that needs to be upgraded. You have food, you'd have, you have this, the, even the small things like toilet paper that, that needs to be provided for hundreds of thousands of soldiers. What did you say to your parents? No, no one wants to say goodbye. No one wants to say, I don't know if I'll come back. No one wants to, to, to face that, that reality. Your mom has three sons going into the army? Yeah, we're three boys. We all enlisted on the first day. I can't imagine what your mother's going through. Yeah. You know, if you had three sons that you didn't know what was going on with them at some points and you had to text them 10 times a day, are you okay, are you okay? It's not what a mother wants to do. While thousands of Israelis make their way back to the country with a sense of duty, millions of Palestinians wondering where they might find safety. In terms of Gaza, what are you hearing about conditions there? We have a reporter in Gaza, but it has been extremely difficult to even get in touch with him because of the power blackouts. The sole power plant in Gaza ran out of fuel, meaning that Gazans are going to be plunged into complete darkness. Yumna Patel, who grew up in Texas, is an American journalist who's lived in the West Bank for seven years. Gaza health officials are warning that hospitals are on the brink of collapse because no medical supplies are being let in. There's no fuel, there's no power. And at the same time, you have more than 80 percent of Gazans who rely on humanitarian aid are not receiving food supplies or the aid that they, they typically do receive. So things are getting worse by the moment. We're talking about fuel running out at the electricity plant. We're talking about water being out for days. How is that affecting uh, life? In terms of, you know, fleeing the airstrikes, there is nowhere to flee in Gaza. I mean, you have a population of more than 2 million people, almost half of which are children, living in one of the most densely populated places on the earth. There are no bomb shelters to go to in Gaza. There are heavy airstrikes above us, and they are close. We can hear them. Please. These are one of the bombs. We don't know where they are bombing. We're not allowed to go in or out of Gaza. Uh, they bombed uh, the Rafah crossing, so no one can go in, no one can go out of Gaza Strip. Uh, we are living under siege and they are trying to kill us in all ways. 21-year-old Tala Herzala, a Palestinian student in Gaza, has been sharing videos of her family home. These are our bags that we packed 
um, if we had to leave the house uh, because at any time we're threatened to, to leave our house because it can be bombed at any time. I took my my university books. Um, my university is, is bombed, but I don't know. I took them anyway. We can't sleep, actually. They bombed everything. They literally bombed everything. Hospitals, schools, universities. With Israeli troops massing at the Gaza border, Noi is in position awaiting orders, with a protracted ground war all but certain. What is the mood among your comrades in arms? Look, you have people who just finished the army, they're 21, and you have people who are 62 years old. You have people with kids, you have people with wives, you have people with families at homes, and no one wants to be here, but it's just our duty. Our duty is calling, and we are coming to fulfill the duty. People are sad, people are nervous, people are scared, but we're also ready and we're going to go in and we're going to complete our mission. Our thanks to Juju Chang for that. And still ahead, a murder suspect tries to race toward freedom with police chasing after her, how she got away from them and made a break for it. And we return to the major developing story, Israel and Hamas at war, the conflict leading to a controversy at Harvard University, the letter at the center of a firestorm. But next, the next round of Major League Baseball playoffs are set. We're going to take a look at the teams battling it out to make it to the World Series by the numbers. So much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden, please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3.
What You Need to Know, a third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love that. It's me. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. It's October, and that means, among other things, playoff baseball. So let's take a look at the road to the World Series by the numbers. Four teams have advanced to the next round after the Philadelphia Phillies won last night to secure the final spot in the National League Championship Series. They did it by defeating the Atlanta Braves, who had 104 wins this season, the best record in all of baseball, and a divisional rival who finished 14 games ahead of the Phillies in the NL East. But... It's Philadelphia moving on. That's the way it goes. They will face off against the Arizona Diamondbacks, who swept the 100-win L.A. Dodgers to move on to the next round. Arizona had finished the regular season a whopping 16 games behind the Dodgers in the NL West standings. And over to the American League Championship Series, two teams from the Lone Star State will square off as the Texas Rangers are set to take on the defending world champ Houston Astros. Both teams finished the season with identical records of 90 and 72. The Rangers swept the Baltimore Orioles in their second round matchup, knocking off the team with 101 wins this season. So, so that means that the three teams with the three best records in all of baseball have now been eliminated. As for the Astros, they will be trying to pull off a rare accomplishment if they beat the Rangers in the ALCS. They'll advance to their fifth World Series in the last seven years. And much more ahead on Prime, including more on the escalating war between Israel and Hamas. There's also another battle brewing in this conflict over fast-spreading misinformation. How do you know if what you're seeing on social media is actually real? And on the heels of massive record-breaking success, there may be another on the horizon, the new project from global superstar, Bad Bunny himself. take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward, first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it.
wherever news breaks. It's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. We are going to continue to bring you developments out of Israel and Gaza in just a bit. But up ahead, the wild scene in a police department when a woman pulls out a gun and opens fire. A murder suspect caught on camera running from police and the latest project from global superstar Bad Bunny. These stories and more in tonight's rundown. Connecticut officials releasing dramatic video of a woman firing a gun inside a police station. Suzanne LaPrize seen entering the Bristol Police Department lobby on October 5th and banging the front desk windows with her gun before firing multiple shots at those windows. No one at the desk and the bullets did not penetrate the glass. Police say they tried to speak with LaPrize, but she fired more shots in their direction. One officer returned fire. Police eventually restrained LaPrize when she dropped her gun. ABC station WTNH reports a court arraigned LaPrize on nine charges. They're holding her on a million dollars bond. Baltimore police announcing an arrest in the recent Morgan State University shooting. 17-year-old arrested in Washington, D.C. on attempted murder charges. Police also issued a warrant for 18-year-old Jovan Williams. Shooting injured five people on October 3rd, four of them students. Police believe a dispute triggered the shooting. A police officer was killed and another wounded in a parking lot shooting at the Philadelphia International Airport. Authorities say the officers confronted multiple suspects trying to break into vehicles at the garage when the suspects opened fire. Police say an individual matching a suspect's description was also pronounced dead. Watch as 35-year-old murder suspect Caitlin Armstrong tries to jump over a fence to get away from deputies after leaving a medical appointment in Austin, Texas. Police say they were escorting her from the medical facility back to the vehicle when she tried to get away. She got about a block away before she was finally caught. The former yoga instructor is behind bars accused of murdering pro cyclist Anna Mariah Wilson in May of last year. Police say Armstrong believed Wilson was romantically involved with her boyfriend. Microsoft completing one of the most expensive tech takeovers in history, a nearly $70 billion acquisition of video game studio Activision Blizzard. The deal adds to Microsoft's portfolio some of the most popular games in the industry, including Call of Duty, Diablo, and Overwatch. It came just seven hours after the acquisition got final approval from Britain's competition watchdog and after Microsoft submitted a revised proposal that addressed concerns the deal would harm competition and hurt gamers. Maybe also that was un preview from bad bunny's new album nadie sabe lo que va a pasar mañana which translates to no one knows what will happen tomorrow the song which has more than 23 million views on youtube part of his 22 track album that dropped today comes more than a year after the massive success of his last album the puerto rican sensation also set to host and perform at snl next weekend Now to the verdict for the two officers charged in the 2019 death of Elijah McClain, the Colorado man whose death in police custody sparked nationwide outrage. A jury convicting one of the officers, but not the other. Here's Pierre Thomas. A Colorado police officer guilty of illegally killing Elijah McClain, a young man whose death shocked the nation. We, the jury, find the defendant, Randy Rodima, guilty of criminally negligent homicide. McLean's mother raising her fist as she left the courthouse, telling reporters she's not satisfied. This is the divided states of America, and that's what happens. McLean's mom clearly frustrated that Rodima faces less than a decade in prison and that another officer was acquitted in the killing of her son, who by all accounts was a gentle person who loved to play the violin 
and whose death raised serious questions about race and policing. The end of McLean's life all caught on chilling police body camera footage. His death, a tragic misunderstanding. It was August 2019, and McLean, a massage therapist, was walking home after buying iced tea from this convenience store. Stop right there. Hey, stop right there. Police confronting stop. McLean after stop. receiving a report of a suspicious stop. person wearing a ski mask. McLean's family says he wore that ski mask because he was anemic and often felt cold. Police grabbed McLean within seven seconds stop. of the encounter. Stop. I have a right to stop you because you're being suspicious. The officers apply a chokehold. McLean tries reasoning with them. I'm so sorry. I have no good. I don't do that stuff. I don't do... Why He's in pain. I can't breathe correctly because. And with that, Elijah McClain's life was soon over. Inspiring violin vigils throughout the country, even though his music was silenced forever. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. As Israel's bombardment of Gaza intensifies, a parallel war is being found on social media. Experts are becoming more concerned about the increasing levels of false information and images being shared on platforms like TikTok and X, formerly known as Twitter. So we're going to look into this a little bit more with Associate Professor of Psychology at Cornell University, Gordon Pennycook, whose expertise is human reasoning and decision making. Gordon joins us now. Uh, Gordon, it's good to see you. You've been monitoring social media posts related to the Israel-Hamas conflict. Uh, are you worried about what you're seeing? Oh, well, certainly. I mean, you see this uh, increasingly after these large events where there's this void of information and it gets filled in with misinformation. And that's and particularly in cases where you have, you know, real lives at stake. This is a big problem. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a problem, seems like, all the time on social media, but especially, you're right, a after an event like this. So do you have an example or two of some of the troubling or inaccurate posts you've been seeing? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, many cases of, you know, uh, old videos being recycled. Some of the videos are not even in Israel. Um, when, you, when you have all this, like, strong desire for more information, you end up getting people who are just posting things and, you know, driving engagement and getting the clicks. But... You know, it's not true, and people need to be more vigilant. Where are you seeing the, the most amount of false information being shared right now? Is there one particular area? Oh, it's, I, I mean, it's, it's all over. I mean, the video was a big driver. Uh, and, and we saw the same thing, by the way, with the Israel, or so with Ukraine-Russia conflict, where, like, people were trying to gain information about the literal events as they were occurring, and a lot of that stuff is not is not accurate. I would imagine for uh, companies, it's like whack-a-mole. You know, once you put one down, something else will pop up. So I'm mm -hmm. wondering, do you think the media platforms are taking it seriously enough, and are they doing enough? I, I think they take it seriously. It depends on different platforms. Like Elon Musk, you know, removed, removed a lot of people from their jobs who would be in the place to help resolve this issue. And so then you can obviously see why so much of it is proliferated on FX in particular. Um, so are they doing enough? I mean, I think obviously not. Uh, when we have these conflicts and these unfolding events where misinformation starts flooding social media, there's no reserves to call in. There's the same people who are working the day before are dealing with the same issue, and there's not enough people there to do it. And so uh, the platforms need to kind of maybe develop like disaster plans that help help. Uh, resolve these issues when they come up. Look, this is a million dollar question, and I know this is gonna be hard to answer, um, but it seems to be more on the viewer, the consumer of this kind of news these days to separate facts from fiction, and that can be really difficult, especially with AI generating you know, better fakes than, than ever before. That's a conversation for another time, but um, what would you suggest the average person do in this country who's just scrolling through their feed looking for information, how can they find what's right and what's not? I mean, the, the biggest thing is to slow down uh, because uh, it's not just that it's on uh, individuals to sort out what's true and false, which is true, but we also perpetuate what's true and false by our engagement, by sharing things or even just watching things. Uh, if the more you engage with things that are false, the more other people are going to be exposed to it as well. And so there really is a burden on us to make sure that we are being uh, careful with what we're what we're doing online. And what that means is that, like, maybe we don't need to uh, 
be so heavily focused on figuring out what's going on at that very moment, we can maybe delay a little bit. And, I, and also, I mean, in general sense, may not be the best for us uh, mental health wise either. So uh, taking a step back is never a bad policy when it comes to this kind of stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And a lot of people really vested in this this particular war that's happening over there. So, you know, I get it. But yeah, you're right. I think everybody at the moment when they see a piece of video or when they see something or hear something b before you share it, you know, maybe take a breath and try to figure out where it came from. Um, Gordon Pennycook, thanks so much for the conversation. We appreciate it. It's an important one. My pleasure. And ABC News Live reached out to TikTok to see how they are actually fighting the spread of misinformation. A spokesperson for the platform tells us they use technology, fact-checking organizations, and thousands of safety professionals to help protect users and have added resources to help prevent violent, hateful, or misleading posts. They added that TikTok removes any identified harmful misinformation. Turning now to a campus controversy, Harvard University, known for its intellectual discourse, is divided over a letter seeming to blame Israel itself for that horrific massacre of innocent civilians by Hamas. ABC's Selena Wang has more from Cambridge, Massachusetts. I know Jewish students feel unsafe, and they feel uncomfortable, and they feel betrayed. Across the hallowed campus of Harvard University, tension, division, and frustration. It feels that if you say something against Israel now, it's just you're supporting, you're a baby killer. After a ghastly terrorist attack on Israel that triggered a war with Hamas this week, the reverberations of the crisis are being felt and heard loudly back on American soil. Police departments from coast to coast are on heightened alert. After a former Hamas chief reportedly calling for a day of rage on Friday, the NYPD ramping up security, canceling vacations, and putting all officers on duty and Columbia University closing their campus to the public today ahead of a planned event, just one day after police said an Israeli was beaten outside of the library. We know that incidents in the Middle East, violence tends to spark acts of hate here at home. We've seen a 400 plus percent increase in incidents this week versus this week last year. Some say Harvard University becoming a microcosm this week for the fears and pain unleashed across the country. On Saturday, more than 30 student groups on campus sparked outrage after releasing a letter that said the Israeli regime is, quote, entirely responsible for all unfolding violence. The statement went on to say that the conflict did not occur in a vacuum, blaming the conditions Palestinians have been forced to live in for decades. The university is ramping up security, including here outside of Harvard Hillel, which is the center of Jewish life on campus. It's been really hard to get people to speak on camera because they tell me they just don't feel safe speaking out. What was your reaction when you first saw it? I was appalled when I saw that letter. You know, when um, people are, when civilians are being murdered and women are being raped and kids and Holocaust survivors are being kidnapped and held hostage, the last thing you do, the absolute last thing you do is you blame the victim. Jacob Miller is the president of Harvard Hillel. He says the lack of support from some of his fellow students and what some saw as the school's initial tepid response has been hurtful. Jews are aching. Um, I know Jewish students feel unsafe and they feel uncomfortable and they feel betrayed. And I, 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 am, I, I honestly don't know. Like, how are we going to heal as a campus? How are we going to move on? The Palestinian Solidarity Committee later put out a statement saying in part, PSC staunchly opposes all violence against all innocent life and laments all human suffering. Palestinian students I spoke with said they are scared to speak up on campus or even mourn their lost loved ones, which is why they aren't showing their faces. I can't be alone because I feel like I'm dying. Imagine feeling like the place that you're from is going to get wiped off the map. I think that if I show my face or say something against Israel is at this time, I just, <laughs> the attacks are just, will be overwhelming. How are your family members doing? I just got a message from my grandmother just letting me know that 10 members of our family had been killed. Some students say they were completely blindsided when their organization signed the letter. I do know that there's a lot of people who didn't really know about it, didn't read it, and then now they're caught, kind of caught in the middle. Harvard's leadership came under fire for not immediately issuing a response to the letter and then releasing a statement some say was not strong enough. A day later, Harvard President Claudine Gay ultimately writing, I condemn the terrorist atrocities perpetrated by Hamas, distancing the university from the student signatories. So something that's caused a lot of 
controversy lately, of course, has been the letter that was signed by more than 30 student groups. I think that the outrage that has, um, that that statement has sparked um, is intentional. It's intentional to um, intimidate um, Palestinians and their allies into silence about speaking truth to power. We feel that we can just get cancelled because we said something against Israel. This doesn't even make sense. Like we are, are in a, the academia, in Harvard, we're supposed to be able to speak about what is happening and even debate about it. While no acts of violence have been reported on Harvard's campus this week, the animosity That's is palpable. This is disgusting. This is sickening. Driving around Harvard's campus today, a so-called doxing truck displaying the names and faces of students allegedly linked to the letter. I, I don't feel safe going to campus and we have friends who've received death threats whose numbers are out there who are getting constant, constant calls uh, from unknown numbers. I don't think doxing is appropriate under any circumstances. I do think people need to be accountable for their words. And so if these students feel like these student organizations signed an op-ed that was not in their name, they should write publicly and say, this was not in my name. Already several CEOs are asking for all the students involved in the letter at Harvard to be identified so they can be, quote, blacklisted for future jobs. Another vocal critic of the letter is former Treasury Secretary and past Harvard President Larry Summers speaking Wednesday on Bloomberg News. The statement by 30 student groups uh, blaming all violence on Israel was a moral absurdity. And then tweeting a request for cooler heads to prevail, saying in part, many in these groups never saw the statement before it went out. In some cases, those approving did not understand exactly what they were approving. Probably some were naive and foolish. This is not a time where it is constructive to vilify individuals, and I am sorry that is happening. Harvard isn't the only school struggling with pressure to take a stand. Wall Street CEO Mark Rowan is calling for leaders at the University of Pennsylvania to resign and donors to close their checkbooks over an alleged failure to condemn anti-Semitism and hate. And an NYU law school student lost a job offer at a top law firm after saying Israel bore full responsibility for the loss of life. Late this evening, Harvard's President Gay releasing a new video statement saying the school rejects terrorism, hate, harassment and intimidation of people based on their beliefs. Our university embraces a commitment to free expression. That commitment extends even to views that many of us find objectionable, even outrageous. We do not punish or sanction people for expressing such views. But that is a far cry for endorsing them. Let's be clear, this is not politics. The wholesale slaughter of over a thousand people, innocent people, grandmothers and the disabled, that is not politics. This is about evil, evil in its purest, most undeniable form. Our thanks to Selena Wang for that. And that is our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. And thanks for streaming with us. Coming up in the next hour, our team coverage continues as fighting escalates between Israel and Hamas, why Israel is urging a million people to leave Gaza. And it was approved back in 2020, but construction never began. Why it's taking so long to finally build the National Museum of the American Latino. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 
three. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us after news. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Hello, hello. Sophie, what up, homie? You got any plans after this? They seem to be happy, and all of a sudden... Please say it ain't so. If you don't hear it from these lips, don't believe it, okay? There are no accidents in the public eye. Taylor is sending a message, hey, she's on our side. Divorcing Jonas, Joe and Sophie. When children are involved, it becomes much more complicated. Very contentious, and then it becomes a mess. Now streaming on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks for streaming with us. We are going to begin tonight with the threat of a looming ground invasion in Gaza as the calls by Israel for 1.1 million people to evacuate. The concern tonight by many, where do they go? Israel dropping leaflets into northern Gaza this morning, telling residents to evacuate to the south of Gaza within 24 hours. Hamas has encouraged everyone to stay where they are. Even as Israel retaliates for the terror attack carried out almost a week ago now by Hamas, the death toll continues to mount, particularly in Gaza, with at least 1,800 people now killed. The Palestinian government says an Israeli strike targeted a convoy headed south, 70 killed, 200 injured. Tonight, we are getting dramatic new video as well of Israeli Navy commandos finish, in the hours finish, after finish. the massacre, pulling Hamas terrorists out of an Israeli military post. We are going to begin tonight with Chief Foreign Correspondent Ian Panel with the concerns ahead of that looming ground invasion. They've been under relentless bombardment for seven long days and nights. And tonight, as many as a million Palestinians are on the move, told to leave their homes immediately and run for their lives. The message came from the sky, Israeli leaflets raining down, warning Gazans they have just 24 hours to move away from the border. A few hours to pack an entire lifetime. With all the borders closed, the only place they can head is south. Some by car, others on foot. And even while they did as they were told, Israel continued to bomb. Today, a rocket striking a convoy of civilians fleeing, killing 70 people, according to Palestinian officials. Israel retaliating for last Saturday's massacre of more than 1,300 people by Hamas. More than 1,800 Palestinians have died since then, too. President Biden, while standing squarely behind Israel, today calling the unfolding humanitarian crisis in Gaza an urgent priority. We can't lose sight of the fact that the overwhelming majority of Palestinians had nothing to do with Hamas and Hamas's appalling attacks, and they're suffering as a result as well. 
The question now, where are all these people supposed to go? The entire Gaza Strip is about the size of Philadelphia. It's one of the most densely populated places on the planet, and Israel has bombed the last remaining border crossing into Egypt. 21-year-old college student Afaf Najjar documenting her family's journey. Salam everybody. Uh, today uh, morning we woke up to the news that we had to, to uh, evacuate. She describes the drive south as horrifying. And even when she got to the end of the journey, it wasn't the sanctuary she was expecting. The moment we arrived to Khan Yunus, uh, we realized that airstrikes were happening in Khan Yunus as well. Uh, very heavy ones. Just, uh, just a couple of minutes ago, there was uh, one that shook the entire house. For its part, Hamas is urging Gazans to stand firm and not heed the evacuation orders. The White House accusing them of using innocent civilians as human shields. And while civilians flee, the militants dig in releasing this video showing the sophisticated warren of underground tunnels they built in Gaza, where they hide and launch their rockets. Across the border in Israel, the military build-up nearly complete. It feels we're now on the eve of a significant military movement by the Israelis into Gaza. The men, the munitions, the tanks are all into place, and now they're just waiting for the order, if it comes, to move across that border. And we spotted this giant military bulldozer. It often leads the charge, plowing through booby traps and landmines, destroying everything in its path. And the Israeli military releasing this video, which they say shows strikes on Hamas targets, including anti-tank missile launchers firing rockets into Israel. Each day, the fighting and the suffering only grows. Our thanks to Ian Panel from Tel Aviv tonight. We are going to stay in Israel and turn to some new information coming out tonight that a, a pair of classified CIA intel reports warned of a potential escalation in violence by Hamas in the run-up to their massive assault on Israel. And it comes as Israel is still finding Hamas operatives inside the country. Our James Longman is in Tel Aviv. Tonight, new questions about whether U.S. intelligence was tracking increased threats from Hamas in the weeks before its attack on Israel. According to the New York Times, two CIA reports, including one issued just days before, warned about a potential escalation in rocket fire from Gaza. But the routine analysis reportedly had no details about the scale and scope of the terror attack, including the new tactic of a ground assault. Before this headline broke today, Defense Secretary Austin was asked during a stop in Israel what the U.S. knew before for Saturday's bloodshed. If we had known or if we know of a pending attack against uh, an ally, we would clearly inform that ally. Nearly a week after the unprecedented attack, Israeli forces are still hunting for Hamas terror cells in southern Israel. And tonight, for the first time, we're seeing images from Israeli Navy commandos retaking a military outpost just hours after it was captured by terrorists on Saturday. This man dragged away, bloody and naked. Those Navy commandos can be heard shouting to Israeli soldiers who are being held captive by Hamas in a bunker there. We are coming, they say. <laughs> that raid just hours after the massacre, one of at least six battles. There, some 60 Hamas terrorists were killed. Israeli forces were able to rescue 250 hostages. The injured rushed away by stretcher. But tonight, at least 100 more hostages remain in the hands of Hamas. James Longman from Tel Aviv tonight. James, thank you. And now to the ongoing chaos on Capitol Hill here at home, day 10 of the ouster of former Speaker McCarthy. And today, Republican, Republicans nominated Congressman Jim Jordan to be the next speaker, but he doesn't have enough votes to win as Congress heads out for the weekend. Here's senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott tracking it all. Tonight, chaos and dysfunction on Capitol Hill. Could Can you get to 217? Ten days after Kevin McCarthy was ousted, now a new <laughs> nomination for speaker, conservative firebrand Jim Jordan. Congress is broken. Less than 24 hours ago, the nominee was Steve Scalise, but he suddenly dropped out, realizing he wouldn't get enough support. Jordan confident heading into closed door talks. I think I can unite the conference. I think I can go tell the country what, what we're doing and why it matters to them. And we'll talk about that. Can you get but I'm, in, I, I'm in. I think so, yes. I feel very confident in that. But after a tense five hour meeting, we learned he did not have the votes. Jordan can only afford to lose the support of four Republicans to become the next speaker. In a secret ballot, he lost 81. Are you supporting Jordan? Uh, no. Then a second ballot. 
Jordan lost 55. Do you seem like you're very far off from electing a new Speaker of the House? I mean, we're not close. We got to get there. Jordan is backed by former President Donald Trump. The Ohio representative is one of the Republicans leading the impeachment inquiry into President Biden and the founder of the far-right House Freedom Caucus that often gave McCarthy trouble. And tonight, there is fear among some Republicans that no one can unite the party. There's not a person in America, and that includes the Republican conference, that is going to get 217 votes out of this body. Just not. Rachel joins me now. Rachel, it really feels like deja vu all over again. So what's the timeline this time? What happens next? And what happens if Jordan can't get the votes? Yes, Phil, it does feel like we are back to square one. So lawmakers have now left town for the weekend. We know that Congressman Jim Jordan will be spending the weekend reaching out to those holdouts, trying to get them on board before Monday. But if Jordan cannot get the votes, some members say it will be time for Republicans to reach across the aisle, work with Democrats to see if there is any possible nominee they could put forward that could get bipartisan support, Phil. All right, Rachel Scott from Capitol Hill. Rachel, thank you. And there is so much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, a new film putting the battle over abortion rights right in the spotlight. We talk to the director about the message she hopes to convey. But next, the dire situation in Afghanistan nearly a week after a devastating earthquake rocked that country's western province. Whenever news breaks, the crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. NBC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from outside the courthouse in Walterville, South Carolina, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. In the last 12 months, Customs and Border Patrol logged 60 migrant deaths due to heat in the El Paso sector, three times as many as the year before. Migrant advocates for years have warned that the hostile desert climate is perilous for migrants who are often abandoned by human traffickers without water or jammed into sweltering truck trailers. Nearly a week after earthquakes and aftershocks struck Afghanistan's western province of Herat, some residents remain living in tents outdoors for fear of more quakes. Multiple earthquakes struck in the western province this week, destroying entire villages in the war-torn country, which has long relied on foreign aid that has dried up since the Taliban took over in 2021. Our next guests are shining a light on the grassroots organization Plan C as the group fights to expand access to abortion pills nationwide while working against the pandemic and the eventual fall of Roe v. Wade. Let's take a look. At the beginning, it was just 
trying to make clear that these pills existed, that they were safe, they were effective. Abortion pills are available by mail. It's a thing. And of course, people said, you can't do that. That's illegal. Joining us now is the film's director, Tracy Dros Tragos, and Francine Cueto, abortion rights activist and co-founder of the group Plan C. Thank you both for being here. Uh, really do appreciate it. Um, the documentary shows much of the work Plan C does, and it began before the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So how has it changed over time, the work? Oh, uh, our work was to spread the word. We knew when we started this organization in 2014 that across the world, in other countries, people had access to safe abortion pills that they could take, purchased over the counter. And yet in our country, we had restricted access to this pill, so we wanted to spread the word. And so that's what we, why we set up our website, and that's what we've been doing, and that's what this film is all about. So, Tracy, let's talk about the film a little bit. Um... This all started before the overturning of Roe v. Wade. So how did that change how you were moving forward here? Yeah, well, when Kavanaugh was appointed to the Supreme Court, that's when I really dug into this. And I, um, it seemed like the writing was on the wall that Roe would fall, unfortunately. Um, and I was, I was introduced to Francine's work with Plan C and their vision to, uh, provide abortion medication through telemedicine to folks no matter where you live in the United States. This is FDA approved medication in all 50 states. And I thought, oh, you know, what a paradigm shift. Mm. Um, is this really possible? And then COVID hit and telemedicine was embraced by mainstream medical community. Um, and then Roe fell and threw it all back to the states, which is where we are now. Right. And Francine, I'm curious, you've always been out there in the open, was never a, a private or a secret organization, but did you ever feel like, you know, broadcasting, say, at least in this, in this film, broadcasting your methods might hurt effectiveness in any area? Well, we were worried and people told us, a lot of people in, the, in our community felt like we shouldn't be so upfront, that it might be dangerous to be so. But we really believe that this would, should be destigmatized, it should be everyone needs to know about it, and that our biggest goal now was to spread the word. So when I got approached by Tracy to do a documentary, I thought, yes, let's do it. When people watch this, um, what, what is your hope that people take away from watching this and what is your hope for the future of Plan C and everything you're trying to do? Thank you, that is the question. That is what, I mean, Tracy's given us an amazing tool to spread the word. What, there are two messages that come through very, very powerfully in this beautiful film. One is that there is a, a desire and a need for people in many states to have access to safe abortion and that it can be done thanks to a whole network of providers who are willing to step up and provide what is a FDA approved, uh, done by US providers, shipped to you in three days, totally safe, totally effective method. So we are trying to spread the word, and that is our hope, that people will know they have options in these states. I feel lucky that we have some new good news in, during these very difficult times. Um, and, you know, borders are, are borders, um, and we now have providers in many states, which are access states, who are willing to step up and help people in the states where access is more difficult. All right, well, Tracy and Francine, thank you so much for coming in and talking about uh, the film. Plan C is showing now in select theaters. And still to come tonight on Prime, as we close out Hispanic Heritage Month, we're going to take you to Washington, D.C. to explore the past and the present of the American Latino and the push for a national museum to honor their history. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. 
With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So, what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. It is the last Friday of Hispanic Heritage Month. And did you know that Latinos stream more than any other population in the U.S.? A driver behind that could be the median age, which is just 30. So why isn't there a place like a museum where we can learn about the imprint and the legacy of the nation's largest ethnic group? Maria Elena Salinas went to D.C. to find out where the battle for a potential museum, a national museum of the American Latino stands. <laughs> When I walk in, you know, it, it, the color, the vibrancy, the sounds, it all takes me aback because it, it's what it means to be Latino. So that's what stands out to me. It's really about learning how far back our history goes in the United States. And I think most people would be shocked to see that we've been here for over 500 years. How do you tell that part of the story in a museum like this? It's really about going back uh, to the beginning, to the roots of Latinos in, in the United States. I think it's important to establish those roots of how deep they are how far reaching they are. And now we have over 63 million people in the United States identifying as Latino. From Mexico to the Caribbean to Central and South America, it's a representation of those who helped shape this country and those who were here almost a century before the pilgrims arrived to Plymouth. What about some of the immersive aspects of this, these exhibits? You have several. Well, the one here, this covers the Pueblo Nations in New Mexico, and we're really proud of this. It, you know, you can feel the figurines, the bread here in, in the oven, in the oven. But the great thing is that if you push this button here, you can smell the, the bread being baked. Mmm. <laughs> it's so good. That's amazing. The Molina Gallery inside the Smithsonian Museum of American History features the first of its kind multi-sensory display that takes you back home. What do you think is the most foundational piece in, in this exhibit? So this beautiful piece here made out of clay by Veronica Castillo is an example of that. It's a tree of life, it's a creation piece, but it has the flora and fauna of all the different countries we come from, right? Mm -hmm. And then all these little figurines, these clay figurines, which are the, the stories, the people we're talking about in the exhibition. It's beautiful. Telling stories through generations and the immigrant experience we all share, including this makeshift raft handmade by two refugees who risked their lives to escape Cuba's dictatorship and economic crisis. It talks about the urgency, right? The, the need to leave, to flee, and, and you do whatever it takes to get here. But also remembering to celebrate our successes and heritage in all aspects of life, like Somos, a 15-minute video installation about Latino identity by Spanish, Venezuelan, American filmmaker Alberto Ferreras. And it has 150 portraits that I took with my iPhone because it was in the middle of the pandemic. And I felt like that was the way to capture the faces of, of, of the Hispanic community. When I was working on Somos, that was part of the goal. That it was, for, for some of us, it's gonna be like, oh, of course, I know this. But for a lot of people, it's not, because they just, they don't live next to you. Um, and, and I think that some of capture some of that. I'm very proud. Latinos are a very diverse and a very complex group. Don't underestimate, <laughs> don't pigeonhole us. I think it's a mistake to think that um, the Molina Gallery or the Museum at Large is just gonna be for Latinos. It's for everybody. And you see a nod to our indigenous roots. And everybody has a story, including the director of the Latino Museum, Jorge Samanillo. I came here, I was about to turn 19, a year out of high school. 
um, and I had a scholarship to, to study music trumpet. You know, when I first came into the Smithsonian Museums, because I saw for the first time, I didn't see Latino stories being told, immigrant stories, but I saw the possibilities of how you can use an object, an artifact, to tell a powerful story. And that, was, that kind of blew me away. So, you know, I got back to Miami and I switched my major from, from music to anthropology and archaeology uh, after visiting one of the archaeology exhibits here in the mall. Is this a full circle moment for it you? It really is a full circle moment, but I always tell people it's not, it's not only about me, it's about finally trying to tell our story. But this is just a first step on the road to truly celebrating the Hispanic experience with the long sought goal of establishing the National Museum of the American Latino on the National Mall just out of reach. Well, right now it's crucial for us to get a site selected. We want to make sure that we have a presence here in the National Mall. And getting that site is an uphill political fight that's been waged on Capitol Hill for years, spearheaded by some who don't just want to showcase the Hispanic American experience, but are living it. When people say, why do we need a Latino museum? I tell them, because our story is not being told. Latinos are invisible in the United States of America. The National Museum of the American Latino Act, co-sponsored by Representative Tony Cardenas along with others, was approved back in December 2020 to start the expansion. Now the challenge is designating a location that requires a legislative approval to allow construction on two potential sites on the National Mall. And representatives Cárdenas and Barragán, both first-generation Mexican-Americans, are leading that battle. It had been introduced for about 18 years, so it did take some time. But what's most important is we finally took the bull by the horns and we finally said, ya basta, it's time, and we got it done. And it's now become law, so that museum is going to get built. So it's convenient for somebody who's mentioned all the time to say, why do we need another museum? But it's inappropriate for them to say, on their argument, that the museum doesn't belong. This political climate is a challenge because some people have made immigration, the border, the issue that they want to weaponize and use to stop any progress. Instead of saying, well, we support this, let's do it, it's the right thing to do, they're putting conditions on it. And again, it's why I'm gonna to continue to say we need more Latinas and Latinos at the table to get it across the finish line. Do you feel that the obstacles that the Latino Museum has faced are sort of like a symptom of bigger issues that have to do with legislation regarding Latinos. I think that when you talk about the immigrant dynamic right now in America, I think that too many of my colleagues have made it a Latino or anti-Latino issue. So when people think about a Latino museum, they think, well, why are you building a, a museum for immigrants? This museum is gonna talk about the American Latino. And many of us American Latinos are sons and daughters of immigrants. So, I'm the daughter of immigrants. Right? Exactly. So part of your story is their story as well. We have something in common. Uh, how many brothers and sisters? I'm the youngest of 11. I'm the youngest of 11 as well. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of beautiful stories that are common and stories that we're going to find out from other people that we probably even know that their story is very different than ours, but they're all beautiful and they're all amazing. You're going to need more than a plus one. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> And while the fight for finding a permanent home for the Latino Museum continues, so does making sure the Latino story is told in the fullest way possible. There's so many different aspects to the Latino community and, and, and what we bring to the table here in, in the United States. And, and a lot of it has to do with culture, with arts, with music, with food, with film. Will that be um, also an important component of the Latino Museum? They're so crucial. That's really when you start seeing the commonalities, right? And those things that really stand out, that bring us together. Because I could play right now uh, a piece of Celia Cruz music to you, and even though she's a Cuban singer, it touches so many people, right? It'll and get me moving. It'll get you moving. You feel the beat immediately. You, you know when you walk into a party, you know when you walk into somewhere, you know you're Latino. Let's fast forward to the day when the museum is gonna open. How do you envision what you're gonna feel when you walk into that museum? And, Inauguration Day. Well, when we open our doors, when that ribbon cutting is going to be very emotional for many people. I know for me it's going to be a sense of accomplishment, feeling proud that, that we were able to do this, that we were able to persevere, just like our people have for many years, and get, get something done, and, uh, and create a legacy, not only for, for ourselves, but for our children and our grandchildren, for many to come. I envision mariachi somewhere along Absolutely. the line. Absolutely, no question right? about it. And a lot of amazing food. Um, and just really, I think we're going to see a turnout of not just Latinos, 
I think you're going to see the diversity of people across this country that are going to come out and support this effort. When you get Cubans together and Dominicans together and Mexicans, Mexicans and Guatemalans and Sudamericanos, etc., all of a sudden you've got a lot of talking and you've got a lot of people with a lot of different ways of looking at what the Latino experience is. And I can guarantee you this. There's going to be a lot of laughter and there's going to be a lot of joy, but there's going to be tears of just knowing we finally, finally have our museum. It's teary right now. Yes. I think we're all looking forward to that moment. It's a labor of love. A labor of love indeed, Maria Elena. Thank you for that. And that's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news context and, of course, analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and on abcnews.com as well. Good night.